Hi everyone and welcome to the first student student speaker session. You can see the lineup in the chat, but I can confirm I've seen all the posters that we're going to hear some awesome science today. So first up, we have Cheyenne Corbett, who will be speaking about her poster on Hubble's law and the expansion of the universe. So um, I did this research with Nuffield, which is a science uh, research placement, and also with also University Jordanstone. And I picked this topic because I really love astronomy and physics. So, and a lot of people don't understand that the universe is actually expanding. So I thought this would be a great topic to uh, study on. So um, I used uh, Ulster University's virtual labs along with reports on the internet to understand uh, how Hubble's constant was calculated uh, and why the Hubble's constant is actually uh, changing and what this means for the future of physics. So in, 1920, uh, in the 1920s, Hubble worked at the Mount Wilson Observatory and he studied um, several variable stars, which are stars that vary in um, luminosity. And um, he published his research and got a constant for the universe expansion, which he got to be uh, twi uh, 67 kilometers uh, per megaparsecs. And uh, a uh, recently, this has changed due to um, advancements in science. So I wanted to research why this is so. So first, I researched alongside also University, and I used their Hubble um, uh, like research center. And it showed me that the universe is expanding. Um, I did a graph showing redshift, which is um, the spectrum of light for of, like different galaxies. It shifts to the right based on how far away it is from our observer on Earth. And I discovered that redshift and distance has a positive relationship. And so I got my own Hubble constant to be 65 kilometers per second per megaparsec which is lower than what a Hubble observed. Um, I also had a like a lab based on Cepheid variables, and I tracked the luminosity of a star and tracked the shift between luminosity and the period, and it gave me a sine graph. So that shows that the luminosity varies up and down. And recently, scientists have discovered that their own Hubble's constant is now anywhere between 65 to 73 uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec. And this means if it is uh, higher than Hubble's constant, that the universe could be expanding at a faster rate than expected. And it also the rate of acceler the rate of expansion could be accelerating also. Uh, and this means for the future of physics that if it is larger than we expect it, it could be accelerating. And we don't know what this could mean for uh, different galaxies. So the Andromeda galaxy should actually be colliding with us in about four billion years time. But due to advancements in Hubble's constant, this actually could be sooner than expected. So it could be around 3.7 billion years instead. And future work, I would love to actually look into dark energy. So Hubble thought dark energy was what's causing the universe expansion. And so I'd love to go in closer to that. And also, I am uh, recently submitting my project into the BT Young Scientists, which is Ireland's biggest science competition. Uh, so that's my research, and hopefully you enjoyed. Amazing. Thank you, Shan. So next up, we have Caitlin Chu, who will be sharing a 3D cellular automator cancer stem cell model using MATLAB and app design. Hello everyone, my name is Caitlin Chu and today I am presenting to all of you my project which is a 3D cellular automata cancer stem cell model which I created using MATLAB and App Designer. And I am a current student at Caltech, so go Beavers, but at the time of this project I was at St. Francis High School in Mountain View, California. 
So here is an introduction to my project. So the goal of this project was to create a user-friendly 3D cellular automata model that uses MathWorks, MATLAB, and App Designer to simulate cancer tumor growth that takes into account certain types of cancer stem cell behavior. Now, a lot of this might not make sense. That is totally fine. We will be going through all these concepts. I will be teaching you about cellular automata, cancer stem cell model, and MATLAB and App Designer. So, Hopefully you will be able to understand everything. So I basically combined these three concepts in my model to simulate tumor growth. And then I analyzed the results and then I compared them with the expected results. And, in and my conclusion was that my model was pretty good. Okay, so what is cellular automata? So the most important concept of cellular automata is the concept of neighborhoods. So if you look at this grid, you will see this black little square. We call that a cell. And basically the shaded cells surrounding that black cell are the neighbors of that cell. And the properties of these neighbors will essentially define the status of that cell of interest, the black cell in future steps or generations. So we can see the neighborhoods in 3D here. This is good because my model is a 3D model. And yeah, so local interaction, how do your neighbors impact you? That is the overarching concept of cellular automata. So what is the cancer stem cell model or the CSC model? So the cancer stem cell model is where only a particular type of cancer cell acts like a stem cell and is responsible for renewing and propagating cancer cells. So as you can see, this right here is the non-cancer cell model. So as, you, so as you can see, all these tumor cells here, they're all propagating. They're all contributing to tumor growth equally. And here you can see the cancer stem cell model you can see that these non-cancer stem cells are not really propagating, but this cancer stem cell is propagating a lot. So it's responsible for a lot of the tumor growth. And why is this important? Because you only need to target a specific type of cell, the cancer stem cell, to halt cancer tumor growth. What are the rules of the cancer stem cell cellular automata model? So the tumor population consists of both cancer stem cells and non-cancer stem cells. As we said before, the cancer stem cells are the ones responsible for a lot of proliferation, and the non-cancer stem cells are not. And each cell will occupy a grid point on a 3D grid. And the cancer stem cells are assumed to be immortal and have unlimited proliferation potential. This is not 100% accurate. However, for the purposes of our model, they are fairly accurate. So, And non-cancer stem cells can only survive a limited number of cycles, Pmax, before dying. So basically, the non-cancer stem cells have a lifespan. They are not immortal. They will die. For every cycle, each cancer stem cell has a probability of proliferation. That means each cancer stem cell has a certain probability that they will divide into two. And a cancer stem cell has a probability of symmetric or asymmetric division. So symmetric division is when a cancer stem cell divides into two cancer stem cells. And asymmetric division is when a cancer stem cell divides into one cancer stem cell and one non-cancer stem cell. New non-cancer stem cells will die spontaneously after reaching the number of cycles specified by Pmax. So basically, after they reach the end of their lifespan, they will die. There is a probability, probability of migration during each cycle that a cell can migrate during into an open neighboring site. So basically, cells can migrate throughout the grid, which is kind of cool. If you think about it, if cell is fully surrounded, it will not divide. So this really goes back to the 
cellular automata rules, the neighbors can affect the cell of interest. There is a probability that each non-cancer stem cell can undergo spontaneous death and be removed from the grid. So much as non-cancer stem cells can die when they, once they reach the end of their lifespan, they can also die before then. So here we are looking at the MATLAB app designer interface. So MATLAB is basically the hard, compu the hard computational programming language and app designer is the, I guess, the part that contributes to the interface, the part that makes it look pretty. So you can see the app designer aspect and this is, it's, it's really pretty. And here you can see the MATLAB code, which is, I guess, not as aesthetically pleasing. Here we can see sample outputs of this simulation. So we input these parameters and it generates this plot, this tumor. And as we put in pretty much the exact same parameters, except we change the color to be green and we change the simulation steps or the number of iterations that it goes through to 400 from 200. And as you can see, it looks very different. Here we are looking at how tumor growth or the number of cells is affected by the number of steps or the number of iterations the program runs through. And you can see that the more simulation steps the program takes, the more cells there will be, which makes sense because over time, the cancer stem cells will be proliferating a lot, producing a lot more cells. So here we are looking at the impact of the probability of proliferation on the tumor growth. So as the probability of proliferation increases, so does the tumor growth. And this makes sense because the more likely a cancer stem cell is to proliferate, the more cancer stem cells and the more total cells it will produce. Here we are looking at the probability of symmetric division and how that impacts the tumor growth. So as you can see, as the probability of symmetric division increases, so does the number of cancer stem cells. And so does to some extent the number of total cells. Both of these make sense because the more likely a cancer stem cell is to divide symmetrically, the more likely it is to produce more cancer stem cells because symmetric division produces more cancer stem cells than asymmetric division does. Here we are looking at the probability of non-cancer stem cell death and how that affects the tumor growth. And as you can see, as the probability of death increases, the number of total cells ends up decreasing. This is because the number of non-cancer stem cells decreases because they are all dying, basically. Here we are looking at the probability of migration, and this does not really seem to affect the number of cancer stem cells or the number of total cells. However, here you can see that the probability of migration does affect the spatial distribution. So you can take a look at the blue, which indicates a probability of migration of 0%, and the green, which has a probability of migration of 100%. And you can see that the blue is a lot more clumped together, not much distribution, whereas the green has a lot more spread. So in conclusion, I would say that my model is pretty successful. The simulation results seem to be consistent with current cancer stem cell theory. 
and I gained a better understanding of the mechanisms involved with cancer cell proliferation and tumor growth. And also, here's my blog, which you can all check out. And if you have any questions, you can contact me there, or you can email me at kchu at caltech.edu. Bye. Fab, that was Caitlin Chu. And next up, we have Max Harvey, who will be presenting bedroom spectrometry using Lego and LEDs. My name's Max and I'm delighted today to be able to be part of this Young Scientist Journal conference talking to you about my research that I've been conducting over the lockdown period. Now the title of my research is Bedroom Spectrometry or to give it its full name you can see that at the bottom of your screens. It is determining the temperature dependence of the fluorescent emission of cooling in tonic water using a Lego combined UV photometer and fluorescent spectrometer which I made myself. Now I think we can both agree that actually the first of those titles is probably a bit more appealing to all of you. But let's jump right into it and I'm going to share with you what I've been doing over the last couple of months. Now, the first thing is, is what was the purpose of my research that I was carrying out? Now, I'm going to detail a bit later on in my presentation about what exactly it was that I was doing. But I thought it would be better to actually show you some of my aims that I wanted to get out of doing this project in the first place. And I think it actually stemmed mainly from the fact that science nowadays is an expensive endeavour. We look at projects such as the Large Hadron Collider, liquid xenon time projection chambers for detecting dark matter particles and gravitational wave observatories. And these are multi-million, sometimes even billion dollar projects that are just way out of the graphs of anything that we can achieve at school as an A-level student like myself. And what I wanted to try and do was to show how students at my level can actually push the boundaries of what students in the A-level syllabus or IB or anything like that can actually do and try and do something a bit different from what you'll just be doing on your normal specifications. And I wanted to look at a process known as fluorescence, which is something which I think is a really cool phenomenon. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that later in a couple of later slides when I actually talk about what I did in the project. But I wanted to look at something which was completely out of the realms of my courses that I was studying within my A-levels and to really try and push the boundaries and what we think about what students at my level are kind of expected to do and to try and do something original that hadn't really been done by anyone that I'd met before. So what is fluorescence? Now, fluorescence is a mechanism for decay within this kind of broader topic called photochemistry, which is mainly about how light interacts with matter. And specifically, it's really kind of looking at how electrons are affected by incoming photons and how this can change the electrons within a molecule and how these electrons can change in their different energies and what kind of effects this have um, on, the molecule, on the molecule itself. Now, the most common kind of thing associated with fluorescence is actually the emission of light. And so basically the process by which what fluorescence basically does is, is when an instant photon comes into and hits electrons within a molecule, it will excite them up into higher basically energy levels within that molecule, a kind of high, higher energy orbital. And from that point, these electrons will then fall back down to their ground state, emitting visible light in a lot of cases, which we can actually observe. And although in order to kind of understand what I've done in this project, you don't have to have a complete grasp of photochemistry itself, it is nice to kind of know what it was that I was looking for. And you can see in the bottom right of your screens that there's actually a picture there of some water on the left and some tonic water on the right. Now, tonic water actually contains a compound called quinine, and quinine is one of these so-called fluorescent chemicals. And it's, um, it's a fluorescent compound, which basically means that when you irradiate it with UV light, it will actually emit blue light. And that's kind of a characterization of fluorescence that we see is when you hit it with high energy radiation and it will emit slightly lower energy radiation. So in this case, we've gone from UV light down to blue light. And um, fluorescence does also occur similarly in biological organisms, but in this case, it's actually called fluorescence. But then of course, we also see it in 
normal compounds or simple molecules such as quinine, but also other ones such as fluorescein, which is a chemical tracer, rhodamine B, which is a dye used for tracking water currents. And the way in which we try to look at fluorescence usually is we use incredibly expensive machines called fluorometers or UV photometers along those kind of lines. And these are multi thousand pound machines or dollars depending on which part of the world you come from and they're really expensive they're really technical they use lots of computer algorithms such as Fourier transforms to analyze the data but also incredibly precise equipment in order to actually take the data in the first place and this kind of poses a problem for anyone wanting to look into fluorescence as a whole because in order to do so like we said earlier science is expensive and although the cost of a fluorometer will, would be small compared to building your own particle collider it's still not a cheap endeavor to go upon and so what i really wanted to do is, is i wanted to see how much i could actually investigate into this phenomenon from the comfort of my bedroom hence the title of bedroom uh, spectrometry and i wanted to see how far i could actually look into this area within chemistry and to try and see what I could find out using simply things that I could order from Amazon online or from get delivered from my house during the lockdown period, because obviously I didn't have any access to school equipment or any labs to do my experiment because being in lockdown during the COVID pandemic. And so what I actually did was, is I found a design from some Norwegian professors of how to build your own spectrometer. And you can see on the bottom left is actually at its fundamentals, what a, the most basic fluorescent spectrometer would look like and this is actually des the design that I followed from these Norwegian professors and it basically works on the fact of having detectors that will detect both how much light how much light is actually absorbed by a sample uh, placed in the cuvette region of the blue square but also how much is actually emitted from that sample as well and so you get a number of different readings looking both at how much light isn't affected by the sample but also how much light is changed um, and basically re-emitted from UV actually and turned into, uh, in this case, we were looking at uh, green, green or blue, or whatever that kind of light that you were looking at for the fluorescence. And on the bottom right, you can actually see uh, the final project that I, or the final product that I actually built. That is a picture of my own spectrometer that I built following these instructions. Uh, you can see the housing in the middle with the cuvette, which actually contains a sample of tonic water. And uh, that is actually, that is this kind of sample that I was looking at for the investigation, which I'm going to talk about in a second that I actually carried out. And you can see it's actually functioning well. You can see the fluorescence coming out from that cuvette and that's being radiated by a UV LED. And then from that, you can look at absorbance data using another UV LED. Uh, as you can look at the circuit diagram, if you understand anything about circuits, you'll be able to look at that and understand. Or you could look at the light actually being emitted from the uh, sample of tonic water by looking at the uh, the potential differences across those green LEDs instead. Um, and what I wanted to test having actually built this spectrometer and realized that it did actually work is how far I could actually take this process and what kind of things could I look for within fluorescence and how sensitive was my equipment going to be? How useful was it going to be? Could it actually be used to perform some basic experiments? And what I actually decided to do was to try and test how temperature affected fluorescence. Now, it this is actually quite a well-known phenomenon or effect on fluorescence is the temperature effect. And so we say that fluorescence actually has a temperature dependency. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to try and more not look at trying to find some new data because this data had already been proven in the literature. But what I was looking to do is to see whether my spectrometer was capable of replicating data in the literature and thus showing whether the spectrometer was actually quite a good thing for people to be able to use to perform future experiments. So in this case, my kind of research was actually more into whether or not this uh, build of spectrometer was actually going to be useful for anything else rather than for actually providing its own new data. And what I, so I, as I said before, I was looking into temperature. So I was looking for the temperature dependence. And so basically what I did was, is I tested um, different samples of tonic water at a range of temperatures from about zero degrees up to 50 degrees. And I was looking for changes in the potential differences across those green LEDs that you saw on the previous slide. So I was looking at changes in the potential differences across those LEDs, which were basically measuring the um, the intensity of the fluorescent emission. 
And having collected data over a number of experiments, what I then did was is conducted mathematical analysis on the data, calculating what's known as the product moment correlation coefficient, which for those of you that are mathematically inclined, you will probably have heard of. But for those of you that aren't, it basically just tells you how close your data is to fitting a straight line trend. And from that point, what I did was is I did a hypothesis test and found that actually my result was significant. And so what I had done is, is I had shown using my rudimentary apparatus, which was built out of Lego and LEDs, was that actually I could show that there was a negative uh, temperature dependency of the fluorescent emission. You can see that in the graph on the screen now. You can see how it's quite clear that there is a negative correlation between the temperature which is plotted on the x-axis and the fluorescent intensity on the y-axis and this was a great success because it meant that this spectrometer that i had built using just basic leds and pieces of lego that i had lying around from when i was younger could actually perform some quite decent science um, from that point what i did was is i went on to do further experiments looking at uh, absorbance data so using just uv leds and i tried to come up with theories for what was actually causing this temperature dependence once again using this spectrometer so this was really pushing the bounds of what i thought could be done with apparatus that i'd built and was using just on the desk in my bedroom and i kind of came up with a number of scenarios that could have caused it and one of them was uh, dynamic quenching whereby when the temperature was increased the excited states the molecules were more likely to dissipate their energy through collisions with other molecules but actually what i found was is that my spectrometer wasn't perfect and obviously it never was going to be but one major flaw in the spectrometer was is that i wasn't able to get kind of spectra of emission and absorption which is what you can see on that diagram on the screen right now um, and because i could only test at one kind of wavelength for this uh, emission intensities or absorbance intensities that I was looking at. And so what I realized was is that if the temperature dependency was actually causing the spectra to shift either left or right in terms of the wavelength of emission, then actually I wouldn't be able to see this using the apparatus that I had. So what I found was is that the results in terms of determining a, de um, a mechanism for this dependence that I had proved in my or found in my previous experiment um, I couldn't actually say for certain what mechanism it was that was causing it. And this led me to actually kind of think that if I wanted to do so, I'd have to redesign the spectrometer, building a modular design where I could actually look at more, a, a greater range of emission wavelengths. Um, with, in, with regards to applications to the real world, although this obviously this rudimentary apparatus is never going to replace typical fluorometers and UV photometry because those processes are tried and tested. They're incredibly accurate and sensitive pieces of equipment. Um, what it does show is that there are ways to get people involved with higher level topics which are not involved within their courses. And that was a real big stepping stone for me into wanting to study chemistry at a higher level because I could really see how actually um, this was a really great way to bridge the gap to different topics that were outside of my courses. So thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm afraid I'm not here live talking to you. But if you talk to me on the Discord server, I will be able to answer any questions that you have to the best of my ability. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Great, that was Max Harvey. Next up, we have Nicole Budeman, who will be talking about her investigation of utilising spent coffee grounds in sustainable sanitary napkins. Over to you, Nicole. Uh, can you all hear me? And um, I can't see the chat. No, we can hear you. Take it away. Okay, okay. All right. Hi, so my name is Nicole Bediman. I'm a 16-year-old girl from all the way in Indonesia, so very far from um, the UK. Um, I'm going to be talking about 
um, my investigation that I did with a friend called the EcoSnap. It's the investigation of utilizing spent coffee ground in sustainable sanitary napkins. So as a girl myself, um, I see and understand the absolute necessity of sanitary napkins as part of women's natural hygiene. However, um, unfortunately, sanitary napkins are made up of plastics. Over 90% of it is made up of plastics rather than natural um, organic products. And because of this, this presents a large issue. On the other hand, in my home country, Indonesia, um, Indonesia is actually one of the world's top producers of coffee. And um, demand of this product in particular has also been steadily increasing within my country. And this thus causes a large production of coffee waste, notably in spent coffee grounds, which is um, just like this picture that you can see here. Um, in Indonesia alone, 26 tons of sanitary napkin is produced per day. Um, and on the other hand, in Indonesia in 2019, it was noted that 10,700,000 bags of coffee was produced. These are huge numbers. And this is an issue because, of course, plastic can take hundreds of years to degrade and contribute to the plastic problem and global pollution. On the other hand, improper waste and management a disposal management of spent coffee grounds can lead to greenhouse gas emissions in the form of methane and thus contribute to climate change and other global um, environmental issues. Being someone who is environmentally passionate as well, um, we created this um, investigation in order to, first of all, um, reduce plastic pollution by creating biodegradable sanitary napkins out of spent coffee grounds by combining these two issues that we see, both in the high amount of spent coffee ground waste in Indonesia, as well as, of course, the fact that plastic is continuously used in disposable sanitary napkins. And the second objective is to investigate the effects of utilizing spent coffee ground fibers towards the maximum liquid capacity storage, absorbency rate, and moisture retention of our created sanitary napkin versus, or in comparison, to our day-to-day commercial sanitary napkins. So a bit of a background, um, in a sanitary napkin, there are usually four layers. This being the emollient top sheet or the very uppermost layer. Then you have an acquisition or distribution layer. And we have the layer, which is the absorbent core. And finally, the back sheet, which is impermeable um, in order to, of course, retain the blood flow. The third layer in particular, the absorbent core, serves as the main function of actually absorbing and retaining the blood um, in sanitary napkins. Natural fibers are extremely advantageous towards this purpose because um, they're hydrophilic, meaning they're highly absorbent, they have strong tensile strength, they're biodegradable um, and renewable, and of course they're disposable, which um, is one of the highest um, functions that are appealing through disposable sanitary napkins we see today. And even more than that, um, in SDG in particular, cellulose makes up over 47.5% of SDG. And this um, tells us that it can be a good base material for the absorbent core in our sanitary napkins. So the method that we had done what we plan to do is the first is of course the extraction of cellulose from SEG. Um, this is of course to be used for the absorbent core in our sanitary napkin. Then we will be using that to um, form the sanitary napkins and the product of it um, itself. Then afterwards we wanted to of course test it in comparison to commercial pads that we see today because of course one of the goals that we have with this is to actually make this something that can be used to um, help improve environmental sustainability um, within sanitary nuns. And we will be testing this um, through maximum capacity tests, absorption rate, and moisture retention. Um, then the data will be collected and it will be analyzed using inferential and descriptive statistics. So this is the product design. As you can see in this diagram, it's the general um, design of how the product will turn out. 
Um, it will also include the following layers. The first layer will be made of gauze. The second layer um, will be made of the spent coffee grounds as, of course, the absorbent core. The third layer will again be um, added with gauze. And the fourth layer will be added with bioplastic because it does have to be impermeable. And the testing will be done through these three tests, as mentioned before. The maximum capacity test serves to tell us about how much um, of the liquid or the blood can actually be stored within our sanitary napkin. The absorption test is um, intended to figure out how quickly it can absorb the blood and um, ensure dryness of it. And the moisture retention is also, of course, to make sure that the sanitary napkin can still remain dry despite um, the amount of moisture that it contains and how well it can prevent leakage and things like that. And the data will be collected and analyzed with a standard t-test, which is um, used to measure the significance of our data results in comparison to a natural commercial pad. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, um, me and Martner have not been able to conduct this experiment yet. Although I'm, I'm, I am really, really excited to do this. I think this coming October, we'll actually be planning to do it if we can gain access to our school's equipment and um, laboratory. But unfortunately, because we haven't, this is still a design and not yet um, has not yet produced results yet. But we do hope that these pads perform as effectively or better than plastic-based commercial pads um, to potentially become an eco-friendly alternative. This way, we'll be able to help decrease plastic pollution in Indonesia and hopefully all over the world, while also decreasing the steadily growing amount of spent coffee ground waste. And that is all for me. So thank you. Thank you, Nicole. That was awesome. Yeah, I think having an eco-friendly sanitary napkin alternative would be great. OK, so next up, we have the team from the U-Talent Ac Academy program. We have Femke, Marit, and Hild. I hope I said your name's OK. Um, and they will be presenting on S. aureus alpha toxin mutants, the efficacy through genetic manipulation. All right, over to you guys. Um, hi, can everyone hear me? Yep. Um, so my name is Marit and I will give you some background to our research and Femke and Hilde will tell you more about our methodology and our conclusions. Um, so during World War II, it was discovered that penicillin, a group of antibiotics derived from penicillin mold, was extremely effective against many bacterial infections. Doctors believed that infections would never be a problem again, and penicillin was prescribed freely and abundantly. However, in the 1960s, its antibiotic-resistant bacteria was found, the penicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA. MRSA resides in about 2% of people. Their skin, nose, mouth, and other places where it's about 37 degrees Celsius. Um, these are locations where MRSA is likely to be found. Usually, uh, man's immune system is perfectly equipped to handle the bacteria, uh, and most people will never even notice them. However, in places packed with people with a weak immune system, such as hospitals or nursing homes, it can cause serious damage. Nowadays, it is known doctors' excessive use of antibiotics for even minor infections has stimulated the development of resistance in bacteria. Where before MRSA was an inconvenient hospital-acquired hospital infection, now it has become an international epidemic. Um, the MRSA used in this study is the mutant version of S. aureus, a gram-positive round bacterium, meaning that its bacterial cell wall does not consist of a pepsidoglycan and outer membrane, but a few layers of pepsidoglycan instead. This peptidoglycan layer plays, among other things, a role in serotyping. In total, 21 different MRSA mutants exist, all with small differences in structure and efficacy. Um, the MRSA bacteria produces proteins, 
Uh, among them is the one this study focuses on, alpha toxin or HLA. This protein punctures red blood cells, causing them to die eventually. MSA attaches itself to a pure lipid target membrane, where a heptameter complex forms. This complex makes a water-filled channel in the membrane. This channel acts as a tap. All molecules can flow into or out of the cell. This causes the cell to either, to either uh, shrink or explode, starting emergency reactions such as apoptosis. These take a large amount of energy. The loss of energy is enhanced by mitochondrial failure and self-ATP leakage. The cell then start, starts autolysis, self-destruction by its own enzyme. In cells with comparable problems, ESCRT dependent release of cellular substances can postpone, postpone programmed cell death in puncture cells. Perhaps this could be a future aid to the research on MRSA related pools. Um, this study was performed as part of the uh, conductor research problem called satellite. Um, satellite is the first program conducting tests using anti-infective drugs besides antibiotics. The program is part of the uh, New Drugs for Bad Bugs organization. Um, it uses an antibody, not an antibiotic, against its uh, alpha toxin. This means that it does not matter whether or not the bug is resistant because the antibody would work either way. Another benefit is that it is unlikely that there will be antibody resistant organisms. Therefore, the drug is sustainable and effective in the long term. For the producer of this antibody and possibly future medicine, it is vital to study mutations in part of the DNA that codes for the alpha toxin. Whether the antibody works for all existing mutations, we will have to find out uh, by examin examining the toxicity of all mutants compared to the wild type, and that is what we did in our study. Uh, this study analyzes the efficacy of three of the total 21 mutations of HLA in hemolysis. Sounds okay. So, <laughs> uh, I'm going to tell you some about how we did this study. Uh, we had studied three genes and multiplied them by using PCR. Uh, so we created many copies of the required specific DNA segment for the alpha toxin. With the agarose gel electrophoresis, we, def uh, we determine, <laughs> determined whether the PCR produced pr produce procedure has worked as it should have. The PCR products are purified with centrifuge and the DNA pieces Gated into plasmids. After the incubation, these plasmids are added to E. coli samples, so the uh, proteins would get produced. With the plasmid purified, plasmids are isolated from the E. coli colony. The plasmids are placed now into new E. coli bacteria and incubated overnight on a medium with ampicillin, causing only the resistant bacteria with the alpha toxin to survive. When enough bacteria has formed, the protein synthesis is, is activated. With sonification and centrifuge, all proteins are separated from non-proteins, and with affinity column chromatography, the alpha toxins are separated from the other proteins. To test the efficiency, the alpha toxin is in different concentrations diluted to red blood cells orbits. Uh, and now on to the results. We placed them in this nice uh, handy graph. Uh, and the assay curve is the plot of the lysation of the rabbit blood cells versus uh, the concentrations of the alpha toxin added in different stages of dilution as the centrifusion progresses. As uh, our figure shows, while in smaller concentration, the difference between the mutants and the wild type is minimal, the less diluted the alpha toxins are, the more lysis takes place. Overall, all of the mutants tested needed to be present in notably higher concentrations to be equally as effective as the wild type. Um, uh, the alpha toxins uh, exist in 21 different types that we now know of, the wild type and its 20 mutants. But in this project, only three of them were tested on how effectively they could lyse rabbit uh, red blood cells in different stages of dilution. 
Um, the results of this experiment indicate that in contrary to our initial hypothesis, the wild type lysis more effectively than all three of the tested mutants because it starts its lysization in smaller concentrations than all of the mutants do. Um, now that the efficacy of the different mutants has been defined, the next step would be to test uh, the difference in theirs compared to when the existing antibody is added. Uh, the designed antibody is now in research circulation and diffuses the alpha toxins and with it the most harmful feature of the MRSA bacterium. Hereafter, it is to be tested whether the antibody also binds with the mutants to result in the wanted deactivation. Hello everybody, my name is Saho Das and today I'm here with Isha Makamala to present to you our project the in silica development of a novel DNA-directed interfering RNA fragment to treat SARS-CoV-2. Our advisor is Somia Suresh. Before I continue with this presentation, I'd like to talk, I'd like to spend some time talking about what about COVID-19. COVID-19, which stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019, was first identified in Wuhan, China on January 6, 2019. Since then, it has spread around the world, infecting more than 6 million and killing more than 375,000 people. It is also called SARS-CoV-2 and CoV-2, the no novel coronavirus, or simply coronavirus. The coronavirus is closely related to the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which was prevalent in 2012 to 2013, and Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, which was prevalent in 2002 to 2003. SARS-CoV-2 affects the pulmonary, and cardiovascular systems by infecting cells with the ACE receptor, which are most notably found in the blood vessels and lungs. There have been many attempts at a treatment or vaccine for the virus by various companies, but neither new drugs nor old have been proven to be definitely effective. So moving on, what is DDRNAi? DDRNAi is also called DNA-directed RNA interference. We're using a short RNA fragment to inhibit the transcription of a certain complementary DNA segment, therefore preventing the formation of proteins that are derived from those genes. DDRNAi uses the animal cell's pre-existing machinery to operate so that it is po potent for a virtually infinite amount of time. Before we get started, I would like to define some keywords. RNAi, which stands for RNA interference, uses RNA to inhibit a gene, siRNA, which stands for short interfering RNA, is a short sequence around 19 base pairs used in RNA interference, which binds to the complementary sequence on the gene, which in turn stops translation. Small shRNA, which stands for small hairpin RNA, is a short sequence with a tight hairpin turn. shRNA is an ar artificial RNA molecule, and it can be used to science gene expression using RNAi by delivering plasmids through viral or bacterial vectors. The mRNA secondary structure, also called mRNA motif, mainly plays a structural role and facilitates target site accessibility, improving efficiency of the siRNA fragment. DDRNAi works by first being transported by a vector or transfection agent into the cell, where it introduces DNA templates to the endogenous RNA transcription mechanisms to continuously produce shRNA fragments. The fragments are then spliced into double-stranded siRNA by an enzyme called DICER that is produced by the human cell. Additionally, RNA helps, RNAi helps design siRNA fragments, which are then inserted into the RNA-induced silencing complex, known as RISC, and this binds to the target mRNA to silence it. This prevents translation and therefore inhibits the function of that gene. DDRNAi has been successful had successfully silenced genes in cases including, but not limited to, HIV, hepatitis A, and hepatitis B. Uh, moving forward to in silico RNA fragment production, and it's also our methods part of our project, the Eurofins Genomics siRNA design tool was utilized to generate possible siRNA fragments and their respective mRNA secondary structures. The mRNA secondary structures were used to find the corresponding siRNA target site for the DDRNAi fragment. In order to verify that the siRNA binds to a region in the known SARS-CoV-2 genome, the fragment sequence was analyzed in tandem with the SARS-CoV-2 genome. One complete similarity was found in the non-structural polyprotein 1AB region, which plays a role in the viral capsule formation of SARS-CoV-2. This means that the siRNA will disrupt the formation of that protein so the viral capsule cannot form. 
In order to verify that the DVRNAI fragment does not share any complete similarities within the known human genome, the fragment sequence was analyzed in tandem with the human genome. No complete similarities were found with human chromosomes 1 to 23 and the X and Y chromosomes, which means that the siRNA will not disturb function in the host cell. The I-score algorithm de developed by Murakumo Ichihara and his colleagues were utilized to determine the most potent siRNA fragment. The sequence shown was used to be the highest scoring and therefore most effective. siRNA fragments of the 10 fragments we analyzed. Multiple other potency and stability tests were conducted and the results verified our findings. Moving on to protein inhibition due to the fragment. The RNA fragment inhibits base pairs 9841 to 9859, which corresponds to a region on the non-structural polyprotein 1AB gene. This gene codes for proteases, or proteins that cleave other large proteins into smaller core proteins. The core proteins make up the viral envelope of SARS-CoV-2 because the gene is inhibited. So because the gene is inhibited, the viral envelope doesn't open and the virus cannot spread within the patient. Next, for administration, in order to properly and effectively administer the siRNA fragment, it must first overcome the barriers of each administration route. There are many obstacles to usual routes of administration. In cutaneous administration, the stratum corneum, or outermost layer of the skin, imposes a barrier. The morphology and anatomy of the lung prevents potent pulmonary administration an ocular siRNA injection poses many difficulties, including physical barriers and possible degradation of the siRNA due to metabolic barriers. In order to successfully be transported in the central nervous system, the siRNA must cross the blood-brain barrier using endogenous receptors. In addition to transporting the siRNA, the carrier must also bind and condense the siRNA, protecting it from degradation. The carrier must transport the siRNA to the target cells and facilitate endocytosis of the siRNA. The siRNA requires its aid from the carrier due to its large molecular weight and strong anionic charge. Viral vectors, though effective, pose a threat regarding oncogenicity, immunogenicity, and cytotoxicity. Non-viral vectors, including but not limited to polyplexes, lipoplexes, and peptide-based systems, are promising tools, tools for gene delivery which can incorporate ligand systems to target specific cell types and are reasonably safe. Moving forward to advantages of using DDRNAI, the method of using DDRNAI to treat COVID-19 confers many advantages, including virtually infinite replication of shRNA fragments, dose treatment, and little to no side effects. The first advantage is that DDRNAI can produce a replenishable supply of shRNAs at a steady level. shRNAs are a vital part of this gene silencing process, making it an efficient way to combat SARS-CoV-2. Another advantage is that DDRNAI can silence multiple genes in the same area by using DNA constructs to initiate a cell's endogenous RNA interference pathways. DNA constructs are designed to make self-complementary double-stranded RNAs, usually short herpin RNAs, that then bind to the virus genome and inhibit formation of viral proteins. The targeted gene will be silenced once the shRNA is processed. The supplementary segments of the DDRNAI may be used to make copies of normal genes which are able to restore functions. In this case, the disease gene's translation is disrupted due to DDRNAI. DDRNAI can also be used to cure diseases where a defective allele causes negative effects, as in sickle cell disease. Through the copies of normal genes constructed by the supplementary segments, the gene's functions can be restored, thus restoring the function of a healthy cell. DDRNAI can also use shRNA to remove the expression that is emitted from the disease protein. The last advantage of using DDRNAI is that one administration is effective for a prolonged period of time since the shRNA fragments are self-proliferating through host cell transcription. This also means that the treatment is dose independent. Lastly, the DDRNAI proposes little to no side effects, making it a safer option than others. While DDRNAI is not the only treatment option, it serves it as one of the most promising ones. They use the synthetic compounds to inhibit the function of proteins such as RNA strand growth inhibitors, in the case of remdesivir, are still possible effective options but they do not have the same advantages as DDRNAI as a tool against SARS-CoV-2. Lastly, we will talk about our future plans and where we are planning to take this project. Our future plans are split into two parts, observing DDRNAI delivery systems in yeast cells and testing the DDRNAI in bacteria with the use of, pla with the use of plasmids, which are circular pieces of DNA that replicate independently from the host's chromosomal DNA. Lab-made plasmids are artificial and designed to introduce foreign DNA into another cell. 
To study delivery systems in yeast cells, we will perform transfection, the process of introducing foreign nucleic acids to eukaryotic cells. Since DNA is negatively charged, it cannot pass through the plasma membrane on its own. Lipofectamine 3000 reagent will be used to neutralize the DNA so it can enter yeast cells. We will use PCR and an LCMS machine to observe whether the DRNAi can pass through the plasma membrane. Before I explain the second part of our future plans, I need to talk about how we ordered and extracted our plasmids. There are 16 different non-structural proteins in the non-structural polyprotein, 1AB, and therefore 16 different types of plasmids we could have ordered. To find a plasmid that corresponded with the DDRNAi, we looked at the amino acid sequence of the polyprotein and found where each non-structural protein ranges from in it. We were able to locate where the DDRNAi lies in the amino acid sequence and found that it corresponded to the non-structural protein 4, otherwise known as NSP4, and these plasmids were ordered. Plasmids came in a stab of spectinomycin D5 alpha cells. We in inoculated a liquid culture with the bacteria and extracted the plasmids from the bacteria using a kit. Plasmids will be transformed into BL21 spectinomycin cells. To insert the DDRNAi into the plasmid before transformation, we will follow the steps of subcloning, performing PCR restriction enzyme digestion, gel electrophoresis, and DNA ligation. A naked plasmid will be inserted into the bacteria as a control. Protein output will be tested by running a gel and using an LCMS machine. The results will be compared to determine whether the DDRNAi can successfully stop translation and the production of the non-structural protein, which will tell us if the DDRNAi is actually effective or not. Thank you for listening. That was awesome. Again, I'm very sorry about the miscommunication, but I'm glad we managed to get everyone presenting. So before you all dash off to the lunch session, a huge thank you to all of our student presenters for those talks. I've definitely learned a lot. And also a thank you to our judges for being here too. All prizes will be announced at the closing session at 3.30 p.m. BST. So make sure you stick around for that. For now, you can head over to the Discord to chat to the presenters and other students if you want to talk about everything you've learned. Um, or you can head over to the lunch session, which I've heard is going to have an awesome quiz with some more prizes up for grabs. So there you go. The links are now in the chat. Thank you all for attending and have a great rest of the day.